Good morning, everyone. Today, the May 20th at 8.05 Eastern Standard Time, we present to you the live peripheral intervention case from Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. I'm Vishal Kapoor, one of the moderators, and this is Dr. Jose Wiley here. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and present a complex uh, and an interesting case this morning. Uh, of course, we'd love to hear questions from you, so during the case or after the case, if you have any questions, please email us at info at peripheralinterventions.org. And just as a reminder, for our annual uh, symposium, the Complex uh, Coronary and uh, Cardiovascular and Valvular Symposium, the dates are June 17th through 19th. Please don't forget to register. You can go online at cccssymposium.org. And this year, we'll have an exclusive session for the Endovascular and the Endovascular Fellow Symposium. So I'll, take it, I'll let Dr. Christian and Dr. Guja take it from here and introduce the case. Good morning, Jose and uh, Vishal. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad Vishal gave the interlude into the uh, symposium. I'd like to welcome all of you to our cat lab for our May uh, uh, 2015 case presentation. So in the cat lab, we have Dr. Karthi Guja, uh, Ray Lascano, we have uh, Krishna, our, our fellow, and then we have uh, uh, R uh, Ricky, our tech, and uh, Elizabeth, our uh, our, our uh, nurse uh, for this particular case. So I want to uh, welcome all of you. We've got an interesting case. It's not particularly complex in the sense of, of the difficulties. However, I think it, it presents a lot of management options that we need to, we need to speak about um, as, we, as we go forward. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. Guja to go ahead and talk about uh, this particular case, present the history, and then I'll go over the angiogram. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a 61-year-old male patient uh, with uh, resting left lower extremity pain. Uh, makes it a Rutherford uh, class 2 category 4 um, and a Fontaine class 2B. Uh, uh, or you can say actually going to 3. But despite uh, analgesics six or more uh, for about more than 3 weeks, uh, he has a history of, uh, again, uh, prior PT of the right SFA. Uh, coronary artery disease, PCI of uh, RCA about 6 months ago for an inferior volume I. He has cardiomyopathy, uh, most likely ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF of 30%, um, hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, reflux disease, and uh, prostate hypertrophy. Um, he is on aspirin, Plavix, uh, Corae, Crestor, Lisnopril, Hydrochlorothiazide, Hydrolazine, Prodonix, and uh, Flomax. Uh, can you go to the next? So on presentation, his vitals are 140 over 70. Uh, it's pretty, sta pretty stable uh, vital signs. Uh, left uh, AT is Dopplerable. PT uh, with faint dopplers, uh, and are definitely not palpable pulses. ABIs on the left are 0 0.5 at presentation, uh, and the duplex shows that in the mid to distal uh, left SFA, uh, the velocities have tripled uh, to 275 uh, from 84, um, and there's a diffuse long lesion, and on the doppler we can clearly see that uh, it's calcified, um, and the uh, patient has significant severe, moderate to severe infrapopliteal disease with monophasic waveforms. And um, I would defer to uh, Dr. Christian for the angiogram. So I want to show you uh, what we found. So it's very interesting. So we know this gentleman. We'd fixed his uh, left, uh, right side in the past. Uh, and uh, we had taken pictures of his left SFA. And uh, at that time, he was not, he was not claudicating. We f uh, he was claudicating. But we had him on <laughs> medical therapy. And we're planning on fixing his SFA. <coughs> Over the last three weeks, he's developed uh, uh, more rest pain. <laughs> Excuse me, and he's actually had uh, tissue breakdown now, uh, starting two days ago, in in, in his right uh, right uh, the anterior tibial artery um, um, dorsalis pedis distribution in the great toe. So 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 the, when we did the angiogram, uh, I want to show you the angiogram so you can see what it was. So he's got this focal SFA, as you can see in the mid SFA, just above the adductor canal, and a diffuse segment of calcification on flora to see you with lumpy bumpy stuff at that stage. Thank you, Liz. And then when you go to the next frame, you'll see that uh, the popliteal artery in general is, is okay, which I'll show you in a second. But then you'll see below the knee, he has, he has a, a, a robust uh, posterior tibial artery coming down along with the perineal, which has some disease. And the anterior tibial artery occludes in the middle. And then when you see in the foot, the, 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 uh, the actual, actually, I was surprised to see how low the ABIs were because when you see the perineal artery actually leads before the posterior, posterior tibial artery, posterior tibial artery is diffusely diseased in the foot, and the anterior tibial artery actually reconstitutes via the perineal artery. 
So if you go back and you look carefully at this angiogram, you, you can clearly see that I think, I think the combination of the anterior tibial artery, uh, which is stenosed and occluded, and, and the perineal artery, which has proximal severe stenosis, is probably the likely reason why this guy has such low ABIs along with his SFA, and now has tissue loss uh, with, his, with, his, um, with, the, with the occluded uh, uh, anterior tibial dorsalis pedis, as well as the, the perineal artery. So it's interesting, to, it's important when you look at this angiogram to look at why this is important in causing the tissue loss. Even though he has a posterior tibial artery, he's a diabetic and, and obviously he, he's got multi-level disease. He's got a, 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 a tight SFA and, and a tight anterior tibial. And the reason I'm presenting this case is to, to talk to everyone about multi-level intervention. So in this particular case, we need to take care of both, both the, both the SFA first, we need to do that safely. And then we need to go after the anterior tibial artery, see how the flow is into the foot, and if necessary, go ahead and, uh, and we'll discuss wh whether we should intervene on the perineal artery as well. So we've got a lot to do today. Um, so I'm just going to go over the, ask Dr. Guja to go over what we plan to do on this particular case with the SFA, and then we'll once we do the SFA, we'll go ahead and talk about the anterior tibial dorsalis pedis intervention. So based on the Sorry. angiogram, it looks like uh, the, yeah. the lesion is 95, 95% stenosis, long segment disease, more than six, more than uh, more than 60 millimeters. Um, and so we're going to go ahead with atherectomy, basically uh, a directional atherectomy catheter, the which Hawk is one. the Hawk one uh, which has, uh, so Dr. Christian will So uh, I'm just going to explain the Hawk one to you. So it's not that we feel that Silver Hawk is going to be the best at dealing with this, but I think because of the fact that you have a long diffuse lesion in the SFA, as you saw, with a focal stenosis, and calcium, the old silver hawks, you would have to go with the actual calcium cutter, or what we call as a turbo hawk calcium cutter, which was a, which was a device that, that needed to have a filter, and, and really, in my opinion, was more of a chipper rather than a cutter. The particular Hawk, hawk one here, this is the new, de, new generation uh, device from, uh, from Committee and Metro, Metro Metronic, and now you can see that it has a longer nose cone, so we're able to uh, c uh, do more passes without having to clean it. Second, it has a higher uh, RPM speed cutter. Uh, I think it was, I believe it's, what's the rate, 800, 800. is it? 800 RPMs as compared to the old one. And third, it also has a much more aggressive jog. There, therefore, it oppo opposes up against the artery and you're able to get more cuts. The last uh, innovation that they've made is they've attached the, the cleaning device to the Hawk. So this way, it, uh, it actually speeds up your cleaning, which I don't think is as big a deal as the, as the other things that we've done. So, so the initial part of what we're going to do is debulk this. Generally speaking, we would go with a pathway medical or, or some sort of calcium um, uh, issues, calcium cutter in, in, this particular, um, in this particular lesion. But, but now we've decided to go with the, the Hawk Wanda and demonstrate how this is going to work. Dr. Wiley, Dr. Kapoor, any thoughts as we start to work? So you would have considered uh, using an orbital atherectomy or rotational atherectomy? Well, I mean, I know... Uh, what made you use this de device... Uh, versus the other two that... Well, I, I obviously in our lab, you have probably the most experience with orbital atherectomy. Um, I myself, I think it's a, it's a device that does work. Have not, can you mag up guys? Have not really uh, used it in these kind of lesions in the SFA, just because I, I worry about the luminal gain that we're gonna get with an orbital atherectomy. Not very, very uh, familiar with the crowns um, that are available, but if you want to, Dr. Wiley, go over that, that would be a great uh, uh, sedge into management of these calcific lesions. But before I do that, let me just show you what we're going to do. Show me a little higher, guys. So what we're going to do is try to pass the silver hawk. So the key is to pass the silver hawk all the way down across the lesion, right? So that's what you want to do. So now you know the silver hawk is going to pass, which was tight, by the way. I, I had to push a little bit. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put the angiogram up on the side and decide what's the level that we're going to have to cut, um, cut cut from. So uh, Dr. Gu just going to freeze this for me when he thinks it's appropriate. And likely we're going to start, he whispered to me 25 to about 35 is what we're going to cut. Sorry, sir. So we're going to start around 25. Actually, it's probably 20, I think, right? Ray, is it 20 or 25? I'll probably go with 25. 20, 26. So we're going to start around 24. Let me start around 24. <laughs> Let's turn it on. Ready? So go ahead, uh, Jose. I'm sorry to disturb so, you. So again, you, you're using in this case a 014 wire for this uh, new device, correct? Right. Okay. So just to keep the atherectomy discussion going on, it's an open question. Do you have any set thought process or protocol to say, okay, if the lesion is so complex or so calcified or the lesion length that determines using one um, atherectomy versus the other? Like, 
Karthik uh, or Dr. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Dr. Guja to answer that one. So yeah. basically, uh, we have we have kind of a set protocol in Sinai, as we shall. We all practice the same protocol. Uh, nobody has any special preference to anything in general. Dr. Wiley is more experienced with the orbital atherectomy, but uh, usually if the lesions oh. are very calcified, depending on the calcification, the eccentric uh. calcification, we consider a directional atherectomy. If it's a just a long lesion, directional atherectomy is better. We have long co nose cones. We have to use a filter, especially if it's calcified, no matter what uh, atherectomy device you use. But if they're, if they're really calcified, we try to do a, a pathway device or a jet stream uh, which gives us uh, a better uh, control and because it has both uh, thrombectomy, uh, kind of you can say it's more like an aspiration right. uh, kind of a mechanical debulking device. So it's easy. You can use uh, um, a CSI device which is also an orbital atherectomy which is good in this case. Exactly. Uh, we are, we in this lab are, uh, except Dr. Wiley, are not uh, oh. extremely, um, you, we don't use CSI as much as we normally other people probably normally do. We either prefer to use a Silverhawk or oh. a pathway device or a jet stream. So, so this, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I no, I was just going to ask you. So this device is technically now universal. You don't have the calcified and the LSC or the LSM like we, we used do. To have before. We have an LX uh, Silverhawk one, on. and we have an LS uh, Silverhawk one. So we are using the cu the calcium cutter here with a long nose cone. So anytime we use a calcium cutter, doesn't matter which uh, device we use, filter becomes necessary. Right. May it be CSI or may it be on uh, a jet stream or may it be a silver hawk. I think Dr. Wiley, out of all of us, has more experience with uh, orbital atherectomy, the CSI device. Off. I would ask him to just comment on it with the with the with the with the, cro the, with the crown sizes and everything he has to choose. On. Yeah. Well. Orbital atherectomy obviously uh, would work in this case as well, uh, as well as uh, rotation. So, uh, Jose, what if you were going to do orbital atherectomy? Do you believe off you're going to you're going to get a big enough lumen here, or do you think that you're going to have to do, um, or do you think the lumen is really going to come more from the um, actually go medial again? Um, lumen medial? is going to go to medial and then rotate back, clock back. I clocked. So, so, or, or would you, or yeah. what, what would your, your crown size be? Now, clock, till you, you go know, I used the largest one, I think it's a 2.5. The uh -huh. problem is that still you're not going to have enough luminal right. gain. So, essentially, you would have to then uh, uh, dilate it with a balloon. I think that orbital atherectomy in itself would not work. You, you have to uh, combine it with... Uh, so, when you say it does not work, one of the thought processes that they all say is that orbital atherectomy is going to off here. So you can see here there's a chunk of calcium that it wasn't eating through. Um, or, or, orbital atherectomy as such uh, reduces the pressures that you can balloon in. Is that true? Well, uh, it modifies the plaque. So theoretically, On. instead of having to go high pressure with a balloon, you could probably dilate it with a less per pressure, decreasing the risk of uh, dissections. You know, again, that all depends in, in the individual case. So I don't think that's a rule. That's the, the, the intention. On. But uh, in most uh, uh, circumstances, you're able to get away with a uh, low pressure uh, inflation after you do your uh, plaque Is modification, it? if you so want to call it that way. So with Silverhawk, we use the filter oh. to protect us from emb embolism. What do you guys do with the orbital atherectomy? I think for every atherectomy device, uh, we should use a filter regardless of what it is. You know, mm -hmm. uh, As you know, in, uh, in an uh, orbital atherectomy, mm -hmm. they say that the... the uh, the debris that's going to be uh, liberated is going to be smaller than an R RBC, but we know that it's not the case in every single uh, um, patient that we do. So I advocate, as you do, using a filter regardless of the, uh, the uh, uh, atherectomy device that you decide to use. Well, it's interesting because everybody says different things, right? I'm just moving it, yeah. Everybody says different things. Uh, I was at uh, ACC and, the, and, the, and our colleagues and good friends from Detroit Dr. Elder and Khaki were both, they don't use many filters at all in, in SFAs, especially all sorts of SFAs. I don't know if the algorithm is with Caspic SFAs. They were very quite clear that their filter use is very low as compared to ours. So it's pretty interesting because, I mean, the way you and I have seen it is that, you know, obviously we teach fellows as they do that, uh, that our filter use has saved us a lot of trouble at multiple times. Of course, until you get into trouble. So right. there, there, there's a lot to gain u using a filter. There's very little to lose. Uh, yes, you increase cost, but the the uh, benefit that you get certainly outweighs the risk of uh, yeah. using yeah, a filter and the cost, in my opinion. 
show me the filter. So we're going to show you the filter here to see whether we have the filter come off PSA, put it on normal. I guess specifically in this case, when you have a patient with active ulcer, you want to make sure you don't do more I damage remember. than what you begin with, especially with the runoff. So you always is better, and with so much calcification, I think it's best to use a filter in order to protect any distal embolization. And then you're chasing distally down, aspirating, you know. You know, you know the, the worry, I guess, becomes the cause, Vishal, as you know. And see, in this, obviously, we don't have any debris, thank God. The, the worry, obviously, becomes the cost. So, so <laughs> the issue here is now, now, now you saw the picture from what Dr. Uh, Dr. Guja just showed you. Go minus, Karthik. So the filter doesn't have debris minus. Uh, the question is now, this is our, 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 um, our post uh, three, three wall atherectomy cut. So the question is, would you guys do another atherectomy cut? <clears throat> would you do something different at this stage? Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on how you would deal with this in this particular lesion? I mean, the luminal gain is, is very good. I mean, you can see the focal lesion is gone and you have nice cuts and there's not much of real concern dissection. So I would probably just uh, uh, go up with, and if you have to use a DCB and see how the results are. And uh, so, so, so down. the question is, what are your guys' opinion on DCB in these kind of calcific lesions? You saw fluoroscopically, there's obvious calcium, right? Let's go with the regular person. Uh, obvious calcium, and 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 the question becomes is, how do you guys deal with with these kind of uh, uh, lesions and uh, in the in the role of DCB, DES, or Supera uh, in these kind of lesions in this kind of clinical scenario? <coughs> well, Prakash, I think the data is pretty compelling. Uh, using a drug-coated balloon uh, right now in uh, lesions such, such as this, I think you, you've already used your uh, your uh, calcium cut cutter or your atherectomy de device opening enough lumen that uh, you should be able to fit a balloon and uh, and deposit the the paclitaxel. But, the, but, the but, risk of but, so. but uh, Jose, um, as you know very well, I mean, Finelli showed very clearly that in, in moderate to severe calcium such as this, which is basically the arc of calcium covers about three quarters of the, of the vessel wall. Here it's probably severe calcium. Uh, DCB results in, uh, you know, a, a greater late lumen loss and, and then likely um, a higher, higher rate of uh, restenosis. <clears throat> and then they feel that DC may, may be a barrier to, uh, to these particular types of uh, cases, meaning calcium may be a barrier. So the question is, and plus this has never been studied in a randomized controlled fashion because you have a guy with tissue loss, and the question is the only data we have with DCB with tissue loss that's randomized was the was IMPACT Global trial, and the IMPACT Global clearly showed uh, actually a worse outcome um, in this particular kind of pa pa in these patients. So, so the, uh, you know, to me, the reason I ask is in this era of DCB, go above, guys, in this era of DCB, oh, you went with the short balloon. Yeah, okay. we have to kill with the 80, okay. right? We have to kill with the 100 remember, but we treated uh, longer because than that. Because the, the, the problem is that with ca calcium, nothing really works four, ve very well. Four. So regardless of the, the device you, you four, use, restenosis four. is going to be higher so to a than board. if it was a non-calcified lesion. So Yeah, but it, I guess okay. you could make an argument of using Supera because if you look at the superb trial with moderate to severe calcification, the one-year patency is pretty impressive. 83% in mild calcification is almost 90%. So I guess if you really, like Dr. Krishnan said, with the amount of calcification, the fem femoral region, uh, I guess super, I mean, Supera could be a good viable alternative or it may be a primary treatment of choice in this case. So, so you can see here, so <clears throat> as, Dr. Uh, uh, as, as Dr. Kapoor just uh, went over very nicely, <clears throat> Supera you know, clearly, clearly shows uh, that, that, that in the superb trial, the average lesion length uh, was, was around, I believe it was 7.2. Right. If you look right. at 7.2 lesion length, uh, you, you, you have a patency rate that was around, primary patency rate, yes. around 83, 84%, or even 88%. I can't remember the exact number. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if you look at Supera 500, Supera 500, the average lesion length went up to 12.3 centimeters, right. and, and your patency obviously dropped off at one year from, from 80 plus to around 74 plus. So, so, you know, the longer the lesion, uh, you know, obviously Supera seems to work better than most lesions. And if you're a TLR believer, the TLR rates also lasted out to three years and pretty much depending on how you deployed it. So, so the question here is obviously stenting scaffolding with Supera, which is great data, uh, obviously non-randomized controlled uh, registry, but core lab adjudicated data, uh, you know, will, 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 is an option. 
versus atherectomy with balloon. So let's look at the atherectomy with balloon data. If, if you take definitive LE alone, and if you take definitive LE um, in, say, non-CLI and chlorotikins, um, and, and you look at you look at long lesions greater than 10 centimeters, definitive LE is going to give you a, a patency 70%. of around 60 percent, 60, 62 percent. Overall, different, definitive LE patency was around 74, 76 percent. I can't remember in that range. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the longer lesions with atherectomy with balloon, it was it was around 60 percent, so which was not exactly an ideal type of patency. If you want to extrapolate the DCB data, if you look at obviously, um, if you look at impact SFA with, with average lesion length of 8.9, you're looking at a patency rate of, at one year of 88.4%. So, so, you know, you've got a lot of uh, data out there that, uh, that, that you could extrapolate. Unfortunately, in this lesion that you and I are looking at, it really come, becomes a judgment call. And the judgment call is, okay, well, I've got calcium. I did atherectomy because I felt like I needed to, to uh, break apart the calcium and debulk as much tissue as I possible. That's my philosophy. I'm not saying that it's correct. Uh, second, second is, um, you know, now do you need to do anything adjunctive other than a balloon in this particular case? Uh, because, you know, the question is what is the role of patency in the healing of this wound? Or, or, or do we first see whether we can get through the AT first and then decide how to treat this? That's the question. Yeah, I, I think that the healing is not completely dependent on the sense of a lesion. Obviously, the infrapapateal lesion is the one that's causing his, uh, his ulcer. I think it's important, this lesion, because it's the inflow to the infrapapateal compartment. Uh, so whether you use a drug-coated balloon, whether you use a supera, you know, mm -hmm. either approach, I think, is, 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 appro is appropriate, and nobody could fault you for using either alternative. Uh, the question is, what, what are you going to do below the knee? Well, the question is, do you, do you need to decide on, on DCB below the knee at this stage, I mean not DCB, on, uh, on treating this lesion at this stage, or do you first go below the knee, see, see what's the outcome, um, or what's the result you get, and then decide whether you need to stand or DCB or whatever this particular lesion? That's my question. Well, I don't because think it matters. the reason, as is, as reason is, how important down. does patency become if you get straight line flow? And I think that's the great question in life, right? The question is, do, do, do you want to go ahead and treat this particular lesion at, with a DCB and say, listen, patency is important. I'd like to get the best patency as possible or a super or a silver. Now, now, you know, I never spoke about the Zilver PTX data. Zilver PTX data, especially the global registry um, of, of Zilver, is basically, up, up, like Supera 500, around 12.3 centimeters. They also had an equal number of occlusions. They also had an equal number of, uh, of uh, what is it called, um, um, to, uh, calcific lesions. So therefore, if you look at Zilver PTX with, with a fracture rate of 0.9%, okay, in, in, the, in, the, in these lesion subsets, you also have very, very good primary patency data with the Zilver PTX at one year. So you, if you look at the PSVR ratios used in Supera 500 versus the Zilver PTX, the Supera, the Supera 500 PSVR was 2.4, while the Zilver PTX PSVR, PSVR was 2.0. So, I mean, there is a role rather than DCB if you're a scaffolder to, to put a scaffolding. So now, I, I, let me pose the question, since I took everybody on a big tour of data here. Let, let me pose the question to Dr. Guja, to you, Dr. Wiley, to, uh, to you, Dr. Kapoor. One, who is in favor of atherectomy and balloon alone? So I guess. Wait a minute, what are your other choices? <laughs> right, okay, two, well, who is in favor of straightforward bare metal standing after atherectomy. Three, uh, three, who is in favor of DES with, with, uh, with cook stand? Four, who is in favor with, uh, of DCB? Five, who is in favor of Supera? So I'll start with Dr. Guja. So I would, um, I have always preferred no stenting technique. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, that's always been my preferred method. There is no data on dart therapy, at least in the United States yet. So I think it's an interesting trial. I think Europe is looking into it. I think that's the future of peripheral interventions. I would go with uh, atherectomy and DEB based on what what you see on the angiogram after the predilatation. If there is no severe dissection, I think you can safely go with DEB. Here, I would probably go with the DEB. Dr. Wiley? I agree with Dr. Guja. Dr. Kapoor? Well, essentially, it's the same therapy. I mean, you know, it's a long, it's a severely calcified lesion. So if we just argue about patency, we know almost at the end of one to three years, we'll have virtually similar patency rate and TLR with Supera or DCB, even though there's no head-to-head -head comparison. So well, well, we that's not true because there is, there is, a, uh, yeah. there is the propensity match analysis 
out of Germany. I know it's single center. It's done by Scheinert's group right. who's coming to our symposium, as you know. Uh, you know, they looked at five-year propensity match analysis, which is not obviously very powerful in terms of its, uh, of its, uh, of its relevance because it's not randomized and it's not head-to-head. -head. But however, they, they, they match the lesions, they match the lesion lens and the patient characteristics, and they follow these lesions out to five years. And what they found was very interesting, that Supera was obviously the, uh, the, the, the primary winner of the patency and the TLR battle. Second was actually bare metal stent, and third was DCB. And this brought up the entire argument of why I'm coming back to you guys is the importance of scaffolding. So, so if, you, if you're worried about scaffolding, uh, you know, you worry about fracture rates and you worry about future therapy. Right. So the fracture rates are, are, are negligent with Supera and per basically are negligent with the Zilver PTX if you look at the randomized trial data at 0.9%, right? So, so, so the question becomes is, well, do you do a DES with, uh, with, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a Zilver PTX or do you do a bare metal Supera saying that I have data out to five years with, with Supera in this type of lesion? And that's my reason why I bring it up. Because I think that at today's day and age, this is an unanswered question. You know, it, what is the role of scaffolding um, in, in, in drug coded technology? Is the late loss that we're going to have in these particular types of lesions uh, at uh, greater than one year because of a lack of scaffolding? So that's my question, because at the end of the day, the drug is gone, the biologic effect has already occurred, and it do, does it become a mechanical issue down the road in, and in the pattern of restenosis? I think so, PK, especially in calcified lesions, don't you think uh, superior, I think, would, I mean, theoretically, would serve better, and the province team, I mean, of course, the power was not great for the study, but still, I would say superior, uh, because in... Um, the, uh, the SFA lesions are not like coronary lesions. They are not like, they. I, I don't think drug, I, I think drug makes a difference, but because the drug runs out, uh, I think the mechanical forces make a big difference in the peripheral artery system uh, when compared to coronaries. So I think superior tech def definitely makes a huge impact in this kind of cases, especially when you're talking about longer stands, especially when you're talking about areas where there is more compression, like adductor canal areas, uh, popliteal areas. Real, real. Mm -hmm. So Pro I, Professor, I have a problem with uh, all this propensity analysis. Exactly. Uh, the, right. You know, you're talking about uh, subgroup analysis of multiple trials, and trying to make conclusions out of this, I think, is unfair and is well, inappropriate. Listen. I think it gives uh, an, an idea what may what may be going on, but I would not draw any conclusions whatsoever based on this. It's a essentially a hypothesis generating stuff. So we do this subgroup analysis and propensity to generate a hypothesis for further investigation. I, so totally I was going. I was just going to say it's just there's no randomized trial essentially to compare. Absolutely. So Plus in this the, case... There are not power to show right. that either, so... Well, guys, listen. I, unfortunately, in the endovascular arena, as we all know, I mean, I've been in it, and Wiley's been in it longer than the two of you. I mean, the, the, the point is, there is not enough data out there, you know, and, and we really do struggle at this stage to, to make decisions. And, uh, you know, and that's why I bring up this, this thought of what is the scaffolding and the role of the scaffolding in these type of lesions. So right now, we have obviously stayed away from the stent. I'm sorry, sir, I know it's going to be a little painful. We, we've stayed away from the stenting in this particular case. So we've gone ahead with a drug-coated balloon, and you can see the drug-coated balloon is going to be left up for about two minutes. I'm really not going to talk about what drug-coated balloon I use. I really think the data is pretty strong with both of them, so I'm not here to you know, say one better than the other. I think that here we decided to do the drug-coated technology because I personally and firmly believe that atherectomy and balloon alone in this type of longer, longer lesion is, 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 is not warranted. The only question here is we atherectomized longer than this particular lesion, and we went with a 100 balloon. So the, so the question, what I'm going to do offline, is obviously we're going to save this to the side. Uh, we're going to come back for the sake of time, and I'm going to have Dr. Guja and myself, we're going to go ahead and, and, and balloon the entire atherectomized area. So we're probably going to have to go all the way down to um, probably Flora probably to around uh, uh, 10 and then up to around 24. Uh, so this way we cover the entire segment that was, that was actually damaged by the atherectomy catheter. So, so, so this is gonna be our strategy for the SFA. Now, what I'm gonna do is, guys, can you give me a fielder, um, uh, actually a fielder and a fine cross, please? Um, what, what, I'm, what I'm gonna do here is, actually, you know what? Yeah, give me the fine cross. What I'm gonna do now is go ahead and get through the anterior tibial artery and then we're gonna talk about how to do it. So we generally leave the drug-coated balloons up for about uh, two minutes to three minutes. So at this stage, uh, the drug-coated balloons up. Uh, Ray is going to prepare the fielder and the fine cross. And, and our, our, our methodology of crossing these lesions below the knee is basically going to be a wire technique. 
So as you can see, uh, we're about a t at about a minute and a half, and Dr. Guja is going to bring it down. We'll take one picture, capture the filter. Give me a trailblazer, not a trailblazer. Give me a uh, a, a vert tip catheter, guys. Prakash, you mentioned that you're going to try to open the uh, the AT, uh, and I'm going to post a question: Why not just open the proximal perineal uh, lesion that, as you saw, has a very robust collateral filling the uh, the uh, dorsalis pedis? It's almost a straight line flow that you have. Well, well I, I think that's great uh, uh, question, Dr. Wiley. I think, you know, it brings back the philosophy of what Dr. Guja has all presented in the, in the past when we talked about CLI. I think the, the question is uh, whether you believe in indirect uh, uh, revascularization or direct revascularization. <coughs> Obviously, the theory of what Dr. Wiley is talking to the audience is that indirect revascularization is, is, is when you're going you're gonna to use the straight line flow into the collateral to provide um, the, you know, nutrient, nutrient flow to the area which needs the, the, uh, the blood, which is the ulcer. However, in this case, I mean, uh, what I'm, I'm feeling is in this kind of patient who's had multi-level disease, uh, direct flow would be better if I can achieve that. If I can't achieve the direct flow, then I'm definitely going to go and open the perineal. And that was going to be my strategy, Dr. Wally. Okay. I was never going to plan on, again, give me the, let's take a little picture, maybe nothing in the filter. Um, I, I was going to plan on not opening the perineal if I was able to get direct flow via the, the anterior tibial into the dorsalis pedis. So now we're just going to check our filter before we, uh, we pull it out. Always, we're very paranoid about checking the filter as people who have seen us in the past know how we, how we do it. So you can see there is no goobers in the filter. So we're just gonna, we're gonna use our trailblazer catheter to pull the filter out and then put our 014 wire through this and then walk it out. That's gonna be our plan. But Wiley, uh, for, the, for the question you posed about the peroneal, um, I agree, I think uh, if you have an yep. artery which has a direct, uh, yep. um, it's, which, yep. is, which is the artery no, for, the, real. for oh. the angiosome, uh, yep. for no. that angiosome, I think we should attempt it, especially you, if, right you, if that artery is a CTO. Because I think, uh, the, the restenosis rates below the knee, no matter what kind of uh, method you use, are pretty high. I think everybody agrees on that, right? Well, that's pretty interesting because I, I was looking at the data with, uh, with definitive below the knee. And definitive below the knee clearly shows that atherectomy below the knee is not, is not uh, what is it called, dependent on lesion length. So if you look at greater than four, I mean less than four, four, uh, four to 10 and greater than 10, you'll, you'll see that the patency rate is, is, is around 80 something percent at one year. So, which is pretty interesting, which is the, actually the only data, can I have the fielder please, that, that, that has really shown any sort of uh, patency below the knee. And you know in diabetics and non-diabetics, with, uh, with the atherectomy data, you, you clearly have good, good, uh, good results in terms of restenosis rate. So, so, you know, that's the only thing. But I agree with Dr. Guja, in these type of long segment, this is not a 10 centimeter segment. This is probably a 30 to 40 centimeter segment, 30 centimeter segment. So you're talking about a long lesion, um, and, and obviously you're gonna need a, a blood flow at least for three to six months, thank you. For, for, for you to be able to, to, to keep this one open. Right. And also, the, because of the restenosis rate, now you are making an artery which is, which is 70 or 80 percent, and with the restenosis, who knows, it might, it's going to punch. And I'm in the, I'm <coughs> the collateral. Uh, you might make it a CTO. Uh, I, I, I think it's worth trying the AT. Uh, I mean, we all know that our success rate for below knee uh, CTOs are, are about 90 percent. Most of the times we get through it. So I think it's worth trying a CTO. Uh, than uh, trying something which is, uh, uh, which is like 70 or 80 percent and uh, making that vessel more uh, restenotic. All right, hold on, let me walk this out. <coughs> and give me, give me the trailblazer, guys. Do you agree, Dr. Wiley? Or? No, I do. Oh, I five do. <coughs> Vishal, what is your practice? No, what would you do? I agree with you. I mean, we'll push obviously try to go direct uh, revascularization and see if we can get uh, inflow directly through the AT and heal the segment. Oh, wow. But if for some reason we're not able to do it, Peroneal is a very good option in this case to treat it and get the collateral flowing into the segment area. So it's so give me essentially a, direct give versus me a, indirect uh, revascularization for and stuff. So you can see here that the only difference that we do uh, here is we're incredibly aggressive with our choice of wires. Uh, we generally just go with either the Confianza Pro 12 or the Win 200 family of wires. And, and what we generally do is, is uh, just start with that very aggressive uh, wire technique. Obviously, uh, can you pull the rail, please? Don't let the wire yeah. go forward. As you can see here, that as you know, that there are multiple crossing devices. I'm just curious, uh, just to, for conversation's sake with the panel, what are the choices of crossing devices that you guys like? What are the uh, what are the other things that you guys like to use uh, in these kind of lesions? 
Dr. Wiley? Well, I'm an advocate of uh, cost savings, so a good wire te technique with Thank a uh, support catheter be behind us you, you're doing, I think, is the, so, so the most effective you, uh, So when do you go with a, uh, with a crossing device? When the wire alone do doesn't go, sometimes if, if I think that, that I may be going subentimal, then I'll try to use a device such as the uh, uh, Viens device that may, may be helpful. So the uh, most of the other crossing de devices, I'm not a, a big fan of them. The advocates of crossing devices would say that you've already created a dissection plane and now your, your chances of, of succeeding with a crossing device are even lower because you've already done that. I think that the Vions device has shown that if you, if, if you locate it outside of the dissection plane, works quite, quite well, at least. Yeah, but I'm saying that once you make the dissection plane, you've reduced the uh, efficacy of that particular device. Well, with any device, uh, even, well, even with the wire as well. You make a di dissection, you So you, that, you, you that's kind of the question, why you would not go with a crossing device first. A torker, Ray? You know, again, you know, you, 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 you gotta think of cost uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, when you do these pr procedures, because the next question would be, if you're concerned yeah, about right. having a dissection, that means you're advocating to use a crossing device in every single Maybe case. That's probably the not, not the appropriate way of treating this le lesion. <coughs> so you're always gonna have a risk that when, when you intervene, even with a crossing de device, that you will have a dissection. So to say that I will only, I will use a crossing device to prevent a dissection would not be appropriate. And number two, uh, to say that I will not use a wire because I have that risk, that means that I will be advocating to use a crossing device in every single case that I do below the knee, which will be inappropriate as well. I guess it, it's essentially a judgment and an operator call. For me, if, it, if the lesion is long, if it's a lot of calcification and you want to try to keep Move it intraluminal, I'll start and give it a shot it's with a crossing right device. But if it's a short focal lesion, you can see the distal oh, well. flow is good, then a wire and a catheter technique works as equivalent to a crossing device. So, uh, so you, you can see these are more subtotal occlusions than full occlusions. Right. I'm able to pierce through. See right there is a little occlusion. Getting through that, now I'm going off the other way, which I don't really like. Okay. So a lot of times, guys, you know, for the audience, I mean, it's not that you know, you're, we're this good or whatever. I think the point is that, that you have um, a lot of underfilling of these vessels because of the occlusion. There's definitely an occlusion here. We just gotta find it. And I think I'm there. See, I'm right there. That's the occluded segment here. Can you guys show me, put this in the center of my screen, please? So you can see here that, you know, can you go a little, um, did we, did, uh, don't, don't worry about that. Um, nothing, nothing. So you, I think we're here now at, at the occluded segment here. So I just want to make sure that we'd use a, a good technique to get through here. Prakash, I want to make a co comment of what you said about the definitive uh, uh, study below the, the, the knee. Again, the data is very li limited. This is a re registry, and we've talked go. about it a thousand okay. times. Uh, so, you know, I would like to, to have a comparison between apples and apples yeah. and not yeah. apples and oranges. They're two different things. No. So again, you know, I'm very skeptical no. of all this information no. that we're getting because no. we don't have level one uh, evidence. I don't like the way that's going. What's that, bro? Can I get I'm concerned about, uh, you know, you, you made what, a comment about the definitive uh, uh -huh. study below the, the right. knee. You know, the, in my opinion, this no, is still limited one, the data. One. This the is one. a registry. Right. Um, you know, I, but, 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 I would but, like but. to have, if we're going to talk about patency between di different devices, that we're comparing apples <laughs> and apples and not apples and oranges. But Jose, but the point is though, if you talk about data, you, 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 you have to have data that's level one. You can't always have data that's level one. Well, unfortunately, I think, I think it's our responsibility. Unfortunately, we don't now. have level one data in this particular area, but we, it is core lab adjudicated, and it does have a lot of value. See that? That is great, but that doesn't make it level one Can evidence. You, you know, it looks good, but it's not enough. And I think that it, it is time now for us to to ask for for level one evidence. Yeah. Just because you have core lab adjudication, that doesn't mean you're making you're making this this study a randomized trial. It is not. <coughs> Well, I guess with the advancements and with the number of peripheral procedures and the interest, I guess, like Dr. Wiley said, it, it comes as I a bonus to, to us eventually yeah. to do a head-to-head -to -head trials of various devices and procedures and techniques to give a real world data to people to see how it works. So, so I don't know if the audience saw that. Dr. Guja very astutely went to another view and was able to see that because we were both concerned here just behind the yeah. scenes talking about where this wire is going. We both weren't really happy with it, and he found that we went into a collateral, and we were heading, yeah, now we're in the foot, and we were heading the wrong way. 
So it's very important for the, the gang at home who's watching. Oh, it's a, lot, a little resistant getting down. So now, so we cross this lesion. Now we're in the foot. So it's important to remember, so he had basically a, a, a segment of a maybe 10 to 15 millimeters, which was occluded, which is where we were deflecting off that collateral. Come forward. So now we're just gonna check where we are. Um, and I don't mean to interrupt the conversation, but I wanted to point that a technique out that Dr. Guja just so nicely showed. So what he showed was exactly what you need to do, DSA guys. So he, we actually placed this in a, in, a, in, a, in a collateral and we're moving it, no, no move, sir. Nice. So now you see that the blood supply to that foot is coming directly from this, this dorsalis pedis to that toe. Give me a, give me a, 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 a um, this one guys, um, a um, percussion uh, command wire. Command wire. As you know, it's become fashionable out there of uh, getting uh, pedal axis. Uh, and uh, I'm a little skeptical of, of the overuse of, uh, of P pedal axis in a lot of these cases. When would you have, when would you choose pedal axis versus uh, uh, anti-grade uh, <coughs> approach? I you think as uh, you, me, and Vishal and, and Karthika have often done here, it's usually after we fail and attempt it uh, at uh, uh, anti-grade approach uh, before we go retrograde. I mean, um, what I is the downside of uh, re retrograde, in your opinion? I think, uh, Karthik, maybe you want to comment on the downside of retrograde? So, I think, uh, you mean I, I mean, some people exclusively use retrograde for all the below knee interventions. Uh, we can use it, but we are a big proponent of uh, keeping the re retrograde access for possible touchdown for bypass, especially in critical limb. So, I think downsides are extremely minimal. We can use it uh, if, we, if the, the, uh, the operator has to be really comfortable with retrograde. And of course, uh, you should have... A little uh, more, bro. No, it's out. It's out. Go ahead. So, you should, you should have a good ultrasound. Uh, the operator should have good ultrasound skills. You can do it under fluoro. But again, when you're talking about also critical limb, fluoro gives you only limited uh, kind of supply, especially subtotal lesions like this. You don't know where to stick. And you guys have seen us fail uh, <laughs> trying under fluoro in a very difficult case right. in the past. So, and we've also succeeded alive as well. But I think that what, you, what Dr. Guja is saying is that uh, we generally reserve it for when we fail up uh, an anti-grade approach. Now, I agree with, uh, with uh, uh, Prakash's uh, common I think that uh, yes uh, you could get access uh, transpedal but the worst that could happen is that you have a complication in the, in the sole transpedal vessel that you have right. then it's very difficult to fix so I, I would reserve it as a last resort if nothing else works right I agree it's like a, I mean basically I mean you're taking you're taking the above, only above. reason um, you're having for the patient to have surgery out by doing a transpedal correct um, I think it. you should always give it an anti-grade approach, and if you can't, if you fail anti-grade leverage, I think the anti-grade success rates in uh, peripherals above are, are right much there. higher than uh, than coronary rates. I think on uh, I mean being in Sinai, I, I think we have ninety percent success rate going anti-grade. I can I can pick and choose cases where we had to go pedal uh, to get uh, to get access, but I think on. I think all of us agree, right? We shall Dr. Wiley. Uh, no, Dr. Yeah, I agree to it. I mean, I guess anti-grade remains a, 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 an access site or the route for choice, and especially below the knee. And if you really have to salvage it, then of course transpedal always is a viable alternative in this case. Off. I think uh, on. Uh, the only problem anti-grade on, comes on. is is uh, when you have a tortuous arch, you don't have enough supply. You know, you don't have enough support. But you can always go anti-grade co common femoral axis for off. it. Off. Uh, which is probably uh, a good off, way to off, do off. it. So, in this case, uh, as, as you know, drug-coated balloon uh, uh, studies below the, the knee have not been very compelling. Off. Right. Uh, off. Even though, the you. theoretically, you know, I don't see why, why it doesn't no. work. Yes, What's your co comments? Would, would you continue using it? Do you think that the study have not been well but designed? Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think the studies which were done so have back. exclusively well used back only uh, drug-coated balloon, but they have never tried atherectomy. I think Dr. Grajani has tried it, but they have never tried atherectomy with DEB. Higher, higher. Again, Low the back. same dart therapy I'm yeah. talking about. Well, uh. well, well, let me comment on that. Uh, first, uh, two first things. First and foremost, the randomized trial with the impact, impact balloon uh, called Impact Deep, ready to inject, Impact Deep, showed that there was an adverse outcome uh, in terms of higher rates of amputation, actually death in the DCB arm, okay? So now having said that, 
okay, what can we, what, can, what, what are some of the things that were issues with that particular trial, right? So he's moving, obviously, but we got flow. So, 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 so some of the issues with that trial was that it used an old generation balloon with old generation coding technology, okay? So that's not the current impact balloon that we have available in America. Matter of fact, that's a balloon that's off the market currently. So, so one, one, of the, one, one of the things was that there was embolization, show me below, that occurred from, those, from that balloon, okay? So, so, so I don't know whether we can truly extrapolate anything from that trial other than to say that that, that particular balloon does not work below the knee. But there was uh, higher thrombosis rate. Well, having said that, you, now, now you, have, you, you have two trials via, 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 actually right about here is good, yeah. via uh, uh, go ongoing as we speak. One, one is with, one is with, um, with the Lutonics, which is actually going on in America, where, where we're going to be able to find out the true answer. So I think the truth of the answer is that there is no current randomized data available for DCB below the knee. The data that is available is a negative, negative at this stage, and we don't know why, uh, whether that's going to be true as we go forward. So what, what size balloon are we using here? Two, yeah. So that so means you will not use it, or you will use it in oh, what, certain cases, randomized? or what would you this do? Is, this is, oh, okay. It's a big balloon. It's just uh, right on the shin. Okay, it's on the shin. I see it. So at this stage right now, there is no available DCB below the knee, Jose. There know, is none. The, the if you had it available, would you use it with the, the uh, data that we have right now? I mean, right now, I don't. Well, first of all, it's not available because the FDA is not going to make it available. Second is, if it was available, I think I would wait for the data to get more robust. I think the, the, the data we have with, uh, with, with UConn um, and, and other, other DES is actually a little more robust than we have with DEB. So at, at, the, at this stage, the patency rates are better with DES, but the question is there's no reimbursement with drug, drug eluding stents uh, you know, at this time below the knee, so that's why we tend not to use DES. So, so at this stage, our, our, uh, you know, to answer your question earlier, the randomized, there is no randomized data available. In my opinion, the best data below the knee that's available at this stage in terms of core lab adjudicated large number of patients That's is the definitive LE. Right. So if you believe the definitive LE data, you would do a directional atherectomy like we did here, followed by a prolonged balloon, and that's our hope. So you're using a 2.5 long balloon? We do. So this is a tapered balloon. There's okay. only uh, two tapered balloons in the market. One is by, uh, by uh, Medtronic, which is the Ampharon, and the second is by now Medtronic, or well, Covidian, which is the Nanocross, and this is the Nanocross. So uh, they chose a 2.530, which I don't think is wrong. Um, and we're going to go up. We're going to leave it up uh, for a long period of time here, and then, and then we're going to go ahead and be done. So as you can see, guys, we started this case at 8.10. It's now 9 o'clock. We've now done atherectomy balloon of the SFA, and we've done atherectomy balloon of the, of the InfraPOP in less than 50 minutes. So, you know, if anybody who says that, that a multivessel intervention in the SFA or atherectomy in the SFA is, takes a long time, that's not true. I just think you have to be efficient in your approach. You have to make quick decisions. You, you saw all the thought process of all the operators here in making these decisions. I think it's important to take all those things into consideration. So now, Dr. Guja, just, just drop the balloon here. Now Raj, would you mind floor. going, going uh, in terms of your atherectomy uh, technique below the, the knee? How many cuts did you do? Well, you know, below the knee is interesting because generally mm -hmm. speaking, we only, do, we only do two cuts below the knee. Uh, we, and I only did two cuts. Actually, I only did one cut here. Yeah. For the sake of time, I would have made another cut, but I don't think it really makes a difference. We generally do two cuts below the knee. So we, did, we do one cut that's, that's lateral and one cut that's medial. But this balloon, you have to make sure you don't go above nominal. And here, nominal is around eight. Why so we, not four so, cuts? Uh, just because I think there's not enough in the vessel there. I think the, uh, the device is quite aggressive, and I think your chances of perforations may be high. So generally speaking, I don't do more than two cuts. Uh, sometimes I just do one cut to get flow, and then I balloon it. What's your anticoagulation of choice in below the knee interventions? Below the knee, we all we basically off label uh, use bilab bival. As you know, the Endomax trial is ongoing. As we and we're a, we're a participant to see whether there's a, there's a indication for Endomax uh, for Angiomax at the at the level of the PAD. You know, there's there's safety data. You know, there's safety data with uh, with. Um, with bival rudin both out of CIS and multiple centers that clearly show that, that, it's, uh, that it's safe to use. However, right now there's no, there's no particular indication. We do use it for longer cases below the knee as well as for, uh, uh, for longer cases in the SFA. Prakash, the, the concept of using these mm -hmm. two cuts with uh, the atherectomy device below the, 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 the knee, where did this came up from? 
Is you know, there any data that shows that forecasts have higher perforation rate, or, or somebody made it up, or, or what? Well, unfortunately, as you know, you know, I, I don't think you can have randomized data for everything. I mean, you know, some could say... No, in registry, uh, is, there, is there a higher perforation rate? Is that a fact or, no, or is I, not? I, I think it's, 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 it's really it's anecdotal from experienced operators. I mean, uh, we, you know, in our, in our lab, we've probably done close to three, four, five thousand 5,000 atherectomies. Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, our perforation rates are very low. And I think in the beginning, we were aggressive. We did, we did multiple cuts. In the, in, the, in the tibials and have gotten into perforation. The, the, the second area where you have to be careful is, 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 uh, is where you have bias. Uh, so do you think there's a, a higher risk of uh, adventitial cuts uh, in, uh, below the knee if you do one, two, or three uh, cuts and that I may don't, increase I, I, uh, restenosis I think from it, the, give me a little, the study that, 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 that you yes, conducted? I, I think this is only gonna, I wanna see the foot only. Yeah. I, I think you're only, you're only gonna see that occur um, if, if you were very aggressive with your atherectomy, I think adventitial cuts are going to occur no matter occur no matter what. So I think I think that I would not worry about that. And in this particular case, um, I, I don't know whether or not it's going to make a difference in the patency. My my goal here is to get straight line flow into his foot, and hopefully he'll heal his wound. And that's our goal. And you can see here, even after this, the flow is actually not that good. And hopefully uh, we'll see that uh, you know we'll have flow through that. No no don't move, sir. Liz, can you wake him up, please? Have you given any vasodilators? We're going to give it now. You can okay. see there is you have straight line flow. Right. So now I'm going to give some vasodilators. Give me a give me a 018 trailblazer, guys. Yeah, we can give it from the proximal AT. Yeah. Um, we're going to go ahead and. Actually, we can try to give it through the sheath. Give me give me a. No, we'll give it from the sheath. It'll be good. Give me a knife right. Fifty mic here. Hold on to this. What's the blood pressure? Are you concerned of distal embolization into the dosage huh? penis with the atherectomy device? 120? I'm sorry, what? what are you concerned it? of uh, distal embolization into the dosage penis when you use uh, an atherectomy device? There is always a concern device? when you do atherectomy of any, any, any kind of atherectomy and below knee lesions. But uh, I think, uh, I think, I, 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 I'm not really Sir, concerned about don't move uh, your leg, that okay? in this case, Dr. Wiley. I think he's just moving and I think there's a lot of flush in the, in the, in the sheet also, I think we just gave it uh, some nitride and we'll see. Uh, I think we have straight line flow and I, I'm pretty sure we have adequate uh, result here. Hold on a second, Flora. Okay. Okay, don't move it. Let me see it right here. No, a little lower. There you go. Don't move your leg, sir. Okay. okay. Ready? Yep. Inject. Skinny. The flush is there, we just flushed it. Oh, there you go. See, it's already there. You can see it. So we have a little spasm down below. Uh -huh. Right. So the question is now, um, you can see there's good flow, but the, uh, did we balloon that area? We got a little bit of spasm. How long did, did it keep that balloon up? We didn't keep it up long enough. You want to just give some... Uh, well, it looks very nice, better. actually. I mean, I'm sure after... You got straight flow. I yes. just, I'm just going to have yeah. to... And this is a great great point for everybody. You know, you see the, the spasm occurs. So give me a 20200 balloon, guys. Show me down below. You want to take a picture here? Okay. Uh-huh. Don't move your legs, sir. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead, Ray. See, it's actually pretty fast. And you have a straight line flow. You know, perhaps in the proximal proportion, you could use another balloon inflation yeah. with a uh, three-five balloon. I think the pro problem is up there, not below. No, you clearly have a spasm below. Yeah, but I think the problem the problem is in the proximal AT. What's the matter? We're not talking to you, sir. You're a, fine. We we'll say three-five may may suffice. Give me a vert tip catheter, guys. Yeah. I think it looks very good. I mean, we. Being intraluminal, we have direct online flow. We just have to do a little bit of modification, just proximally to the balloon and right. some so, prepping so, the vessel. And it's so let me, let, me, let me sum up for the audience here, because the, the rest of it is just touch-up work. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do now, show me above, please. Mag up, please. Well, what we're going to do now is take the catheter, the uh, mag up here, please. Take the um, 035, uh, or this four French um, uh, vert tip catheter into the tibial. So what I'm going to do is place it at the ostium of the tibial. I'm going to get more nipride. Can I have more nipride, guys? And verapamil mix. Take out the, uh, the wire, please. I'm going to take out nipride, verapamil mix. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to treat this directly, and then I'm going to go ahead, and and then I'm going to do a prolonged balloon angioplasty of the distal um, and and the proximal anterior tibial. We already got the vessel open. After that, if I have, I doubt I'll have recoil because I don't have dissection. If if I have a recoil or dissection. In, I, in any spot there, I may consider drug, a drug eluding stent placement if I feel that the wire is, 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 is going to cause, uh, I mean, if the dissection is, what is this now? That's for up MO. How much? 2.5. So the whole thing? Yes. Give the whole thing? Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so I'll, at that stage, I may go ahead right. and use a drug eluding stent. If, the whole thing. If, if that's not the case, then I'm done. I'm going to go back and drug eluding stent, the, 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 the proximal. Uh, uh, excuse me, I'm going to drug coated balloon, the proximal SFA, uh, where we did not, where we treated with anthrectomy but did not treat with drug, and then we're going to be done with it. So, so I'm going to stop here, it's 9-5, we'll take this final picture, but now you know basically we're done with this case, we're just going doing some touch up, we're, we're under our hour that we want to be, and, and we're going to be done, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, low mag please. So I'm going to give you a nice injection here to show you how it looks after Verapamol. Sir, don't move your leg my friend, okay? Thank you, my friend. Okay, Cindy. So as you can Much see, uh, nice. it's like uh, it's most of the time okay, it's all spasm. So, right. so are you moving your leg? Don't move your leg, sir. Can you ang angulate the camera a little more? It's yeah, uh, he's so moving a lot. Well, so it's because of the ulcer that you know. We, hold on, Flora. Hold this right here. Okay, let's try that. Show me a little higher, Cindy. Don't move. Thank you. Sit. Don't move, sir. So we need to treat that segment right yes. there. Yeah. You see that? That segment needs to be treated. So once that segment is treated with prolonged balloon, then we'll go then we'll, then we'll go ahead and, and, and we'll be done. So again, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Dr. Wiley. Thank, thanks, Dr. Kapoor. So, so while Dr. Guja wires this and gets to work, I just want to go do a quick recap. I'm going to do it here rather than do it outside because we got a very busy lab uh, a day here at Mount Sinai. Uh, so the bottom line is what, just to recap, this is a gentleman who, who, had, who had an ulcer with multi-vessel disease of the SFA and, and of, the, of the tibial artery. So our, our, our initial principle was to do the angiogram and identify the area by angiosome which was affected. And in this particular lesion, it was very clear that the, that the dorsalis pedis anterior tibial, tibial di distribution was most important. We considered uh, uh, what are the different approaches to do this, and obviously we knew that we needed to get a straight line flow and a good pressure head in, in order to be able to get nutrient supply to this particular territory. So we first addressed the, the SFA. So at, at that stage, we, we talked about the different modalities of treating a calcified stenotic moderate segment SFA. We went over the, we went over the data with atherectomy, drug-coated balloon, drug, drug eluding stent, bare metal stenting, as well as supera. And, 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 and we were able to go over and decide on an algorithm uh, on what we decided to treat. We also went over when to use distal protection, when not to use distal protection. And in this particular case, we used distal protection along with, along with uh, atherectomy followed by drug-coated balloon stenting. Uh, drug coated balloon angioplasty. We got a very, very excellent result, followed by which now we went ahead and did, we, we, we talked about how to cross this long segment, chronic total occlusion of the anterior tibial artery into the dorsalis pedis. We chose a hydrophilic wire to enter into the dorsalis pedis artery, and then we went ahead and, and, and used a, a crossing wire such as a WIN 200 or a Confianza Pro to go ahead and get through. Once we got through and con confirmed our position in the dorsalis pedis artery, we changed out to a, a command wire, and then we went ahead and did our atherectomy. We talked about the necessity of one wall versus two wall versus three wall cuts, and then we went ahead and did a, balloon, a prolonged balloon angioplasty, and as you see, we, we, had, we had a very good result. We did have, uh, uh, encounter some recoil for which we're now going to do prolonged balloon again after which uh, we'll be done and stop this case. As far as anticoagulation is concerned, we used Angiomax, and we will, we will, go, ahead, we, we, we will go ahead and use um, um, antiplatelet therapy, dual antiplatelet therapy, for, 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 the, for the next, uh, uh, in this case, over a year because he has coronary stenting. So at this time, I think we're done. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Guja. Thank you very much for your input. <coughs> Ray, thank you. Ricardo and Elizabeth, thank you. 
you too, Dr. Wiley. I'd like to tell the audience, and I know they're going to finish up, but b before they tell you about the symposium, we're going to have well, we're going to have four live cases from outside Mount Sinai, two from uh, Leipzig, Germany, and then and then we're we're going to have two from Kingsport, Tennessee, one from Scheinert's group from Leipzig, and uh, Dr. Schmidt's group, and one from Dr. Dr. Metzer's group in Kingsport, Tennessee. And hopefully, we're trying to do exemplary cases to go ahead and show you, uh, you know, our technique and the, really the accepted technique of, of uh, endovascular and go over the data and really help your practice. So I thank all of you for your time and thank you for joining us here at Mount Sinai. We'll see you at the symposium. Thank you, Dr. Wally. I'll let you finish up. Thank you. Uh, I want to commend you, uh, Prakash and uh, uh, Kartik. This uh, is a complex case uh, made look easy, even though it was not so. You did a very good job. It was an excellent case. Thank you for your input and especially the data and the, the techniques. We will love, like Dr. Christian said, we have our CCVVC symposium. We love to see you there, June 17th through 19th, and specifically the endovascular and the endovascular fellow symposium. The next live case will be June 24th, so we'll see you next time, uh, June 24th at 8 o'clock in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you very much. Make sure to uh, register in the symposium at cccsymposium.org, cccsymposium.org. Uh, the registration is open at this time. Thank you.